there's no plan that they ever articulate right. about how they want to actually help workers. They oppose raising the minimum wage. They oppose paid sick leave. You mentioned that New York Times article titled, Don't Buy the Republican Appeal to Workers. And so I guess let's start with that. What are Republicans trying to do to appeal to workers, you know, insofar as they are workers, right? You know, you can appeal to workers on non-worker grounds. You know, maybe you appeal to them in, in you know, this social issue that they care about or, or whatever. But but there are there there is a class of Republican politician that is that is is trying to make a a quote unquote working class case for the Republican Party. Right. So wh wh how are they doing that? I mean, I think a lot of it is optics and play acting and, you know, it's through, I mean, the examples that I that I included in the piece, we have um, Dr. Oz, who's a, you know, bazillionaire, um, who, you know, with, you know, more houses than I have fingers, right? Um, who's running for Senate in Pennsylvania and you have him um, going to the supermarket, pretending he's a regular guy, buying vegetables for a veggie tray and like complaining about the cost of it and, you know, just trying to act like he's just a regular Joe, like going to the store. And then the ad where he's, I don't know how many different guns he shoots, but there's like <laughs> guitar, twangy guitar music in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I've seen people analyze that and like, he, you know, he shoots and he hits, some, you know, he shoots the gun and he hits something, but apparently it's like he didn't actually hit it, but that's a separate question. But it's just like really using these. Well, like, now, so hold on, Terry. So you're telling me that you're questioning the sincerity of those videos where <laughs> uh, Dr. Oz is is shooting guns and, and listening to country music. I mean, maybe in one of his mansions, he, <laughs> he has some guns and listens to country music. Right. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of um, using sort of clothing and using, you know, attacking coastal elites and a lot mm. of dog whistles, um, you know, and and sort of phrasing that sort of speaks to, you know, sort of identity issues. And a lot of it is, um, you know, when I what was so interesting when I looked what, what sort of spurred me to write the piece was that I saw a few different examples all around the same time of Republicans and conservatives actually standing up for workers, which almost in, in U.S. workers, which almost, you know, which is very, very rare, right? Aside mm -hmm. from talking about um, China and like railing about China and how bad China is, like you don't really see many instances of actual concrete policy action that they are willing to take to protect workers. So I saw or cases where they'll champion the worker against an employer. So I saw right. these three examples and they were so interesting to me. One of them was the case of the public school coach in Bremerton, Washington state, who insisted mm -hmm. on um, praying at midfield very publicly with students um, in a, you know, kind of coercive way for the st student athletes in a way that was, you know, not appropriate for a public school employee, right? So that was one. And he became a real right wing cause celeb and, you know, everybody loved him. So that was one. And he won his case in the Supreme Court, even though he was, I mean, the facts of the case are extraordinary. Like, he was offered other more private places to pray. He right. wasn't fired. He was placed on paid leave and then opted not to reapply for the job and then claimed mm -hmm. discrimination. Yeah. He also, um, the school district tried to moot out the case because he had moved to Florida in the meantime. Um, and they said, like, he's not going to move back to Washington State for a $5,000 a year job coaching mm -hmm. football. And his lawyers filed papers saying, absolutely, he will immediately be back to coach the team. And meanwhile, there's been follow up reporting about how the school district tried to rehire him and like he's not coaching the yeah. Bremerton <laughs> right. high school football team right now. Right. right he's going on right. the right wing talk show circuit. So that was one case. Another was a case involving a couple of Kroger's employees who were um, let go because they refused to wear a heart logo that the company had put on their new aprons. And the heart had like three colors. It was like yellow, two shades of blue and red. 
And the company had some kind of like corporate speak explanation of what the heart was about. It was like for mm. our, you know, the red is for the freshness of our food and the uh. yellow is to uplift every day. I mean, it was like classic kind of corporate interpretation of, you know, whatever, like, and, um, but these two workers felt that it looked a little bit too much like a rainbow and that they believed that it uh, was meant to support LGBTQ rights, um, gay and lesbian rights, and they refused to wear it. And the facts of that case, again, are pretty extraordinary. In the, their depositions, they were shown logos for a number of other um, major national companies' um, logos, brands like Google and the Olympics or NBC, and all of them, they were just shown the logos. And they said, yes, I think that that, that is too much of a gay rainbow for me. Mm. And one of them even um, – was shown the Skittles logo and felt that the Skittles logo would be objectionable oh to gosh. her religion. And they said that they actually like rainbows because, of course, rainbows come from the Bible and the right, Noah's right, Ark right. story. They said they liked rainbows in general, just not the rainbows that were mm. expressing gay rights. But the thing is, like, all of this is just wild. But then when you look at the actual heart, it's not even a rainbow, right? And they refused <laughs> right. to wear it and they were terminated for that. And the EEOC, led by a Trump appointee, very concerned about, you know, religious um, you know, discrimination against people for their religious beliefs. The EEOC brought the case and a Trump appointed judge um actually granted um I mean, the 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 specific leak, like procedural aspects of it are not interesting to general people, ex except lawyers. But basically, a Trump appointed judge kind of upheld the discrimination part of their case, and they ended up getting a settlement and getting ninety thousand mm. dollars each. So that was the second wow. case. And then the third case was um, during the time when a lot of companies were mandating vaccinations um, and most of them were doing like vaccine or test every week. So, you know, there were other options. But when they were mandating vaccinations, there was a small almost all workers complied with that. Some people liked it, some people didn't, but like people complied. And, you know, I think the statistics are depending upon the, you know, the statistics, the statistics I've seen are sort of 95 or 97 percent of people whose employers required vaccination just went ahead and got it. Mm -hmm. And a few Republican-led states um, rushed to pass laws, making sure that people who quit or were fired because they refused vaccination would be eligible for unemployment insurance. And, you know, I support a broad safety net for people who are unemployed, of course, but these were states that were really had have always been like really miserly about unemployment mm -hmm. insurance. They had turned down and prematurely ended additional unemployment insurance that was paid by the federal government that wasn't even being paid from within their state. Some of these states don't allow um, victims of domestic violence to get unemployment insurance. And so you see that contrast of like, these are the favored workers. We want to make this statement that they get unemployment insurance because they're turning down the vaccine. And so what I saw yeah. when I looked at these three, and they're, they're all kind of disparate, right? They're different industries. They're different kinds of issues. But what I saw when I looked at all three is that they're not standing up for workers in relation to their the Republicans and the conservatives in these cases. They're not standing up for workers in relation to their wages mm -hmm. or paid sick leave or the right to have a union or, um, you know, workplace safety and health. It's all like these culture war narratives. Right. right? It's us versus them. It's, you know, the the you know, godless heathens trying to, you know, incur, you know, trying to make incursions on our um, Christian, conservative Christian country mm -hmm. um, or the government trying to, like, make us have these vaccines, um, which, you know, all how all of COVID just got so politicized is like one of the great tragedies um, of our time. Um, and so that was the thing that I found really interesting was that there's no real plan that they ever articulate right. about how they want to actually help workers. They oppose raising the minimum wage. They oppose paid sick leave. They oppose paid family and medical leave. When there were the child tax credit that was sending people money um, every month, it just helped so many people um, just, you know, afford the Cut necessities. Cut the child poverty rate in half. 
Right, exactly. You know, and they oppose that. They oppose, you know, limiting the price of insulin, like all of these different things. And in so many different ways from a lot of different angles, really help working people live mm -hmm. their lives um, and help help workers as workers, help working families. Um, they oppose all of that. But then they have a person, a worker who like sees a Skittles bag as a front for gay rights and they're willing to like ch that is who they're going to champion as you know in relation to the workplace and that right. contrast to me it was just so striking and so you know like ab absurd and like it's one of those things where if it weren't so devastating to people's lives it would just be pure comedy Right. Well, and, and you have another article in the American Prospect called uh, The Real Victims of Cancel Culture Are America's Workers. And, you know, a lot of these are, are kind of in line with like there's this broader cancel culture narrative about, you know, oh, conservatives are censored and all this and and we've got to take the vaccine and, and we've got to wear pride pins. And, you know, I could envision a policy that, um, you know, actually does protect them in these narrow type of culture war instances. You know, I think that the I think that the praying in in um, that coach I think is is a pretty unique thing. But you know, I don't I don't I don't know. I don't I'm I'm fine with people not wearing a pin from a company. You know, if they don't want to, I think that's you know I, I have no objections to that. And how how could we protect that while also protecting other people's freedom of speech? Well, we could uh, uh we could strengthen the union <laughs> at Kroger. We could institute policies that would help strengthen the union's bargaining position at Kroger um, so that none of the workers have to wear, you know, these these corporate messages if they don't want or that they can wear their own messages if, if they would like. And, and, and of course, you know, we actually see uh, Republican politicians and attorneys and, and, and all of this fighting workers' rights to wear union pins at work. So on the one hand, they're saying, oh, you shouldn't have to wear this pin that's not even a gay pride thing if you don't want because you think it's a gay pride thing. And on the other hand, you should have the freedom to do that. But on the other hand, you shouldn't have the freedom to wear a union pin if you want. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, there's, it, it's just the only times that they actually help workers as workers is when it narrowly intersects with these weird culture war narratives that they have. Yes, I think that's right. And I, that was what so struck me about these cases was exactly that point that you make. And and I think that your point, too, about how, you know, strengthening unions actually supports everyone. It helps mm -hmm. all workers from being canceled. If you want right. people <laughs> to have the ability to, you know, I mean, just cause termination, people mm -hmm. can't, can't, you know, what just cause termination is, which is included in, um, you know, basically all union contracts, people can only be fired for a reason that's related to their job performance. And also there's typically a requirement of progressive discipline. So you get some kind of warning um, before something so, you know, stark happens and so devastating as losing your job and losing your livelihood. Um, and if, if people really cared about making sure or um, that people weren't canceled at work, strong unions are the best way really to do that. Um, but I mean, they're really again, the only way to do that almost. You know, we can talk about passing just cause laws in, in different states, but, you know, the state enforcement is so difficult to keep up. You know, we've got laws on the books. We ostensibly have child labor laws on the books in Alabama, right? Uh, but we still, we've still had children working in manufacturing facilities, and we're going to be talking some more about that later in the show with with Sarah Lazare about the, you know, businesses and bosses trying to loosen child labor laws. But yeah, you, you know, uh, it's it if you are genuinely concerned with making it more difficult for bosses to fire workers because they don't like their speech, then that's the kind of thing that you should be that you should be championing championing more unions more protections for unions just cause in the state law stuff like that but they're not doing that oh, right absolutely and the you know passing the pro act there are so mm. many obstacles for workers who want to organize a union and 
all of the recent surveys show massive increases in support for unions. I think that there was a recent study that, you know, a survey that 70 percent of Americans uh, approve of unions and about half of non-union private sector workers said that they would join a union if they could. And meanwhile, the private section, private sector union density rate stays in the like six to seven range. Right. And this is because there are so many anti-union, there are so many obstacles and because American corporations, in contrast to corporations in you know, other developed countries, which have accepted that, you know, workers having a voice and having, I mean, the idea that unions are so, you know, radical and adverse to the interests of their country, of their company is just wild. Like unions do not want their company where they work to fail. They want Mm -hmm. it to succeed because if it fails, the workers are going to be out of a job. Of course, they want the pie to be divided a little bit differently, right? But like, Mm -hmm. you know, unions can be beneficial for companies and American companies don't seem to understand that. Like they, unions can reduce turnover and have much more stability among your workforce. You can have a better trained workforce. You know, there's there's some research showing that they increase um, productivity, which makes sense because if you're not like constantly churning through people, you're going to be more productive. Um, And so in other countries, you know, the the idea, like a union is just, you know, and you have these employers who kind of say like, well, we don't, yes, you know, in some factories, you know, some, you know, in the old days, like people needed unions because they were so horrendously oppressed. We don't need them now because we're basically decent. But the thing is, a union is just a way for workers to have a collective voice that and have, you know, some collective ability to bargain en masse with the employer. And like, that's just not that should not be a radical thing that is seen as adverse to employers interests and again in many developed countries it's just much more accepted um and that that's just part of the of the picture in industrial mm-hmm. policy and in in the economy um but here it's just seen as so um you know, oppositional to the interests of of companies, which I think is is a big mistake. But as right. we were talking about the, the politics of it, yes, like re, you know, Republicans have opposed the PRO Act. Um, I think Marco Rubio came up with some proposal that was like, Re-institute you know, we want unions, we, yeah, right, exactly, <laughs> sweetheart unions, you know, yeah. um, that would be kind of employer dominated, and that's the kind of voice that he wants, um, you know, that he says he wants to give workers, and so. So, you know, it's just to me, it's just so stark um, how how critical it is for people to have unions. Now, I would take issue a little bit with one thing um, that you said, which is talking about sort of, you know, I do think that government standards and government enforcement is really important as you know, I think that that's sort Mm -hmm. of another important um, I mean, not that you were arguing against it, but just sort of the notion, you know, the fact that like there were these child labor violations, it doesn't mean that the laws aren't having an impact in deterring a lot of violations and a lot of, Mm -hmm. you know, there are a lot of employers out there that the law, even if the law isn't perfect, like I believe strongly in strong enforcement and effective enforcement of the law. And I've devoted you know most of my career to that. But I still feel like having really strong pro worker laws is helpful because there are employers who try to follow the law and setting community norms and setting out like this is the public standard that we accept that we expect. I think that that's that that's very important. And having those baseline labor standards allows unions to have a floor to then negotiate mm-hmm. up from you know so like if you don't have whatever minimum wage overtime paid sick leave like once you have these things required by law unions can build on that and negotiate for even more um so i do think that those government standards and government enforcement matter a lot even as there's you know imperfectly enforced and right. massively under re- enforcement is massively under resourced um, but i do think that both of those pillars really matter for protecting workers and creating better working conditions absolutely uh terry gerstein director of the state and local enforcement project at the harvard law school labor and work life program uh terry thank you for talking to us this morning i appreciate it thank you so much for inviting me it was wonderful having a conversation with you 
you just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project. And you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm. 